So that's what I'm saying. The text is like an object. It's going to change perspective based on where you're standing. I don't know. Hello? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I missed you, baby sweet. It was a day. Hmm. It was a day. Please tell me you're seeing this too. From Seattle, we are drinking the movies. I'm Taylor Baker. And I'm Michael Clausen. Oh, hey, Michael. Oh, hey. One month later. It's been a hot minute since we last recorded. How have you Quick. been? I've been good. I didn't get to go to Europe. I didn't visit the Parisian provinces, as some of us. But I also did not smell urine in the streets. This is true. It's good to be back. Um, good to have you back. Good to be back watching movies. It's unfortunate that you coming back means I had to watch Serenity be bad and class mm. disappoint me. Mm. But, hey. Take another trip when there's a better weekend of releases. Yeah, there you go. We'll get into it. Uh, Yeah. New year, new movies. 2019. Sundance is on. Oscar nominations are out. Lots has happened since the last time. We had a record of, uh, what was it, a $15 million sale for a a comedy film, I think, just happened. Oh, at Sundance, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, and then there was a a $12 million film sold. It's, uh, It's... Things are progressing without Harvey quite nicely, it seems. Yeah, I think <laughs> uh, I think Amazon spent about forty million in total. Whoo! Good little chunk of cash. I'd take it they didn't acquire the first impression we're about to do for boys. There, I think they developed that one internally, right? That is correct. Shall we uh, now take we a look? Over? Let's do it. First impression for boys. Job one is supporting the seven brave heroes who put themselves in harm's way each and every day. For us. Fuck, fuck the seven. Cheers. Cheers. That was the boys. What do you think? Our first impression of 2019, which I have little to no interest in watching, to be perfectly honest. Good to know. Good to know. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know that there's anything here that excites me. Superhero kind of show. Um, I don't think it... The look itself is very appealing to me. It kind of has a DC superhero movie look to me. Um, It's certainly dark. I I don't know that I'd call it DC. I I actually haven't seen those, so that's probably not fair. I've just, you know, been familiar with the dark, moody, brooding kind of thing. It's kind of the signature of Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg's superhero projects, Mm. based on my experience with Future Mm. Man and Preacher. Mm. Looks a lot like those, but also yeah. like Amazon learned from the tick mm. about how to do some of those other effects. I actually really, really loved the books, the boys, when mm. I was uh, oh. in those years after high school when I was a big comic book nerd. Um, yeah. They were probably my favorite to continuously pick up and read about the brutal goings on. Um, the show looks good. I'm going to yeah, watch intrigued. it, but yeah. I, I definitely don't think that um, I don't see it being a broad hit. I see it being mm. a swing and a Jack Ryan. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, looks, it's big, and I think, to me, it, it has, I don't know that it will be a broad hit, but it, I think it looks sort of like it's aimed for broad appeal. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't know. If if I'm going to get on board with the superhero show at this point, I think it, it just needs to feel fresh. I don't know that this really looks like the one that's going to... Um, do something new for me i think i think what's interesting is that it definitely marketing wise should scratch the itch of prime subscribers that aren't enjoying the a24 releases oh most definitely like i yeah whoever is being left in lurch by eighth grade being released and first performed is like i this isn't for me is gonna love this show so it's a great middle ground yeah yeah um it will be interesting to see how it does but um I don't know that there's just much here that strikes me as interesting. Yeah. The, I don't know. The it marketing specifically bland. in place on that official trailer too is bad generally. I mean, there's good bits of cinematography I think happening the way that Evan and Seth tend to do, but content wise, it was a shitty trailer. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it just yeah. wasn't interesting to look at. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, even if it were a movie, I wouldn't be terribly excited, but the, the thought of doing it for, you know, 10 hours, that just seems like a, an endeavor. So, yes. I don't know. Well, 
in the world of content, we need more. <laughs> yeah. That's the boys. And speaking of boys, let's get to Hellboy. Let's do it. You made me a damn weapon. I just wanted to help you become the best you. Some dads get their kids Legos. We didn't even talk about what we're drinking today. I think this is Northwood IPA. Is that right? It's either Northwood or North Bend IPA. I think that's right. Delicious. It is. Good pick. It's very crispy. All right. We just watched the trailer for Hellboy. Would you call this a reboot? Is this related to the previous installments? I'm a little unclear on that. It's a reboot. Reboot. Starting over. Yep. As what I would call the only resident lukewarm comic book fan of this show Mm. myself Mm. um i'm concerned Ooh, uh it's not it it could be great i hope that it proves my first impression wrong that it doesn't look great uh but i'm also like the old man where it's like that's not my hellboy Mm. that's not my ron perlman that's not my uh father character from the from world war ii uh, Ian McShane is great actor. Mila Jokovich mm. is great, but it's t- I used to Doug Jones, Selma Blair, Ron mm. Perlman, and Yermo del Toro behind the camera. Yeah, and I I just generally didn't enjoy what I just saw. Yeah, I think I'm with you. Um, I did see the Del Toro one, which I think was like number two. Is that right? Or he did, did he both. do a couple? Oh, he did a couple. Okay, he did two. Um, yeah, Hellboy and then Hellboy to the Golden Army. Yeah, which is one of the most luscious films that's been made creature wise. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess I would expect it to be mildly entertaining. Um, I wouldn't describe it as particularly nice to look at. I thought some of the effects were a little ugly to the eye for me. Uh Um, It reminded me of Jack and the Giant Slayer. If you saw that at one point. No, I never saw that one. It was a decent film about a, a beloved tale with pretty shitty cgi yeah yeah that's kind of what was striking me here i also don't like david harbour's long hair as hellboy oh you like the the clean cut look is he bald in the originals i'm trying to remember or is it like a flat top i i really don't i just know that i didn't (laughs) like that it's not this yes that's that's the one thing that i know i didn't like his hair uh which will come back around in velvet buzzsaw (laughs) Mm, yes it will um yeah, you know, it's the one that I'll maybe see on a Sunday afternoon if there's nothing else. But otherwise, I don't know that I'll well, make a April point. it's April 12th, so there will mm. be nothing else. Yeah, that's the time for this kind of movie. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you think this will find an audience? Um, it's tough to say. If people are keened up from um, Shazam and then Captain Marvel and then they're waiting for mm. Avengers... Because that's how this is, we're about, I think it's next month we get Shazam, or maybe it's the end of this month we get Shazam. Then on March 17th, we do Captain Marvel. Then this is the superhero fodder in the middle before, uh, maybe it's late April's Avengers. Mm. Yeah. So it's, if the comic book fans are hungry, this will certainly yeah. be something that could build that. Yeah, following. might just be the good timing. It kind of yeah. serves as a holdover. Cool. I, I'm worried. <laughs> yeah, that's Hellboy. We are mixed, to say the least. Yes, both these that titles seems even, are That seems a little generous, fine. actually. Yeah, <laughs> Both these titles are going to be okay if you like your superhero stuff. That's first impressions. But we are going to do our first impressions of what we think our most anticipated films of 2019 are. Just Let's real do it. quick. We're going to go back and forth. You want to start at number 10 or number 1? Maybe just broadly speaking, are you excited? For the year. Think it looks like I a good year? I am very excited for the year. It cool. looks like a great year. Me too. It, I'm uh, optimistic. I don't think we ever made a claim about how we felt about 2018. Maybe right now I don't now think we did in any really broad sense. How did no. you feel about 2018 in cinema? Well, it's a little weird to talk about because I saw, you know, more movies in 2018 than, you know, any other year of my life by a wide margin. Yes. So it's like my sample size is huge. huge. Um... So I would describe it, for me personally, as a pretty good year. You know, I had probably 30 titles that I can say I very much enjoyed and that I thought were good movies. And that seems to me like a, like a good, decent number. Yeah. Um, 
so yeah, I, I, uh, it was a good movie going year for me. What about you? I, I don't think it was a good year. No, I think it was a good year for me. Like you, I have those, you know, the one through 30 on my list. You could have swapped them and I wouldn't have put up too much fight, which means that there were a lot of good movies. Yeah. But when I think about 2017 and that there were three movies that I absolutely like that just were amazing to me, Blade Mm -hmm. Runner, Dunkirk and Mother, Mm -hmm. um, were the, that the next, top tier yeah th- yeah and i didn't have a top tier find last year mm, gotcha um, yeah. as much as i loved hostiles it wasn't top tier mm. in, in that way where I, when i think about blade runner or dunkirk or mother it's just like i can't believe what was accomplished set piece wise camera wise ca- like there's just nothing like that for me just I next wi- level i wish burning could have done it for me the way that it did yeah. for you like that's the one film that I just missed on as a viewer mm. that could have been there, I think. Yeah. But otherwise yeah. there was no top tier. And I think this year there will be a top tier film that will come out of it. And I'm actually leaning towards it maybe being Ad Astra. Ooh. Yeah. Which is not my most anticipated film of the year, but it is one of them. Um, but I, I, I do have some, some high hopes there. I could that, see it happening. That just might be on my list. <laughs> so do you want to go number 10 or number one? Uh, let's do number 10 and count down to number one. Yeah. Want to go first? No, you go first. Okay. At number 10, I have Ari Aster's follow-up to Hereditary. Midsummer. Midsummer. Very pumped for it. No trailer. I don't think I've even seen a still from it yet. I didn't um, either. Just, uh, knowing how much I loved Hereditary, I'm excited to see what he's got. I really hope he summons another King of Hell and then yes. continues to make films doing that. Midsummer: The Return of Paimon. <laughs> no, no, not payment. Give us a different devil king. Oh, new right? devil king. Because there's like okay. seven devil kings in mm. hell. Mm. And if you summoned oh, all I of them it. and then made a super villain movie about Whoa. the kings of hell murdering people on earth, Whoa. that'd be a pretty cool movie. This blew my mind I'd be about excited. what his long game is. <laughs> Mine is uh, also a horror film mm. from Jordan Peele called Us. Very cool. Yeah, we have both seen the trailer. Didn't do it for first impressions, but looks pretty good. Yes. Yeah, I think that's really going to um, uh, find its way into the conversation like Get Out did. No, no, it's going to be it's going to be a more genre type picture, Mm. my impression. Um, Mm. You know, it's it's going to do great business, but I think it's going to quiet place itself Mm. where it's going to be the talk of the town until June. And then everyone's going to kind of fall off the train. Mission Impossible is going to take up too much attention. Mm, yeah, there you go. Speaking of which, he signed a contract to make two Mission Impossible films. Christopher McQuarrie did really? while you were in Europe. Wow, that guy is devoted. Yes. Love it. That's awesome. Just catching you up. What's your number nine? My number nine is Jennifer Kent's follow-up to The Babadook, The Nightingale, which is a I, period yes. colonial horror film. Very excited. Um, heard, heard some good things recently. out of Sundance and Venice, I think. <laughs> um, not overwhelmingly positive, but I'm still very interested. I still haven't seen The Babadook. Oh, um, really? When I first read the title, I already knew what it was mm. as an allegorical name. Mm. Um, so I, I just was like, I think I get it. I'll get to it. And then I just never got to it. I put it in the My mm. Stuff category on Netflix or whatever, and I just never clicked play. Mm. So that'll be a good excuse for me to get back to it. Because from what I've heard, it is deplorable, messy, and very, very good. Oh, I Um, thought you meant like in a bad way. No, no, like in a great way. Like uh, it it sounds kind of like the picnic at Hanging Rock, but terrifying. Mm. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, the Australian (laughs) uh, sense. Yeah, definitely. And the the hole in the ground style. Um, Number nine. My number nine is a film we've already talked about and seen the trailer for that was supposed to come out last year, but is coming mm. out uh, next month or the month after, Gaspar Noé's Climax. Yes. Which I, I'm i sure Sofia Boutella will creep up my favorite performers of the year very quickly once I see that film. Absolutely. In a, in a way, I'm kind of glad it didn't. Like, there, I could have... I was almost a little worried that this might come out kind of close to Suspiria and then people might be picking one or the other. Like, I'd rather this kind of get its own time, you know? Um, That's a good point. It it does deserve its own time. But I also wanted to have watched it already, so... That makes sense. (laughs) Number uh, eight. You're number eight. Number eight. uh, Alex Ross Perry's Her Smell. 
we talked about it on First Impressions already. Um, Elizabeth Moss looks good. Yeah, I like his work a lot. Pretty pumped. So we'll get Elizabeth Moss in at least two films in early 2019 here. Between us and um, that, right? That's right. Uh, my number eight is Greta Gerwig's Christmas film, Little Women. Mm-hmm. Yes. Which has Got a, a full 12 months cast, to wait. And I, I just, I love her style. Yeah. I still think about that end uh, of, of Lady Bird when Saoirse Ronan's in the, the college dorms and she says, what's mm. wrong with the greatest hits? They're the greatest hits. That, that really true. spoke to me um, as a person. And it's like, come on. So yeah. I, I look forward to more of her influence in dialogue of this classic story. Definitely. I'm pumped. Number seven. Number seven is the Safdie Brothers Uncut Gems. Mm -hmm. Another one. No trailer, no nothing, image-wise. Well, I've seen stills for it. Have you? Actually, I think I have seen one of Adam Sandler looking a little grimy, maybe. Yeah, the production photos. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I loved Good Time. I loved Heaven Knows What. Um, I'm excited to see it. I agree wholeheartedly. It mm. It is in my extras, just like Midsommar mm. is. Yeah. just didn't outdo my excitement to see Jordan Peele direct again. Yeah. Uh, my number seven is James Mangold, bringing mm. it way back to the early episodes. New film, Ford v. Ferrari. That's right. I and about I this never one. thought that I would put a film about cars so high on my list, mm. at least since Rush. But here we mm. are. <laughs> a good movie. Yes. Yeah. Um Cast wise, who's in this? Anybody uh, noteworthy? I'm sure there is. I just um, it's one that I'm a little not so up to date on, to be honest. Um, two really small performers that no one's ever liked. Uh, sarcasm dripping from my I voice. I can hear it. Uh, Christian Bale, ah, small performer. You uh, hate him. Personal, yeah, mm -hmm. just hatred. Uh, Matt Damon. Oh wow! Not not a very big actor. And then we've got uh, John Bernthal bringing up the the back of it with a bunch of mid players and then the inimitable Tracy Letts. Ooh, great stuff. Solid cast. I like it. Yeah. Um, what cool. is your number six? My number six is James Gray's Ad Astra, which was, uh, can I we say I... samesies? Yeah. That's your number six. That's my number six. Woo! Samesies. Yep. Yep. Um, I, uh, I almost, um, would uh, put High Life on here, but I thought I would just go with one space movie in my yep. top ten. I, um, see, I thought you'd put Claire Denis' High Life on here, so oh. I didn't put it on here. Yeah. Because um, I thought you would do it, because it's Claire. Yeah, you know, I've seen two of her movies now, not her, her biggest ones, but I'm kind of over two on her, actually. Um, so I'm trying to uh, put that out of mind. I'm a little more excited for what James Gray can do with it. This is going to prove me being right that John Ortiz is about to come back. Oh, yeah, that's right. Nice. And it's going to be nice to see uh, Brad Pitt and Ruth Nega and Tommy Lee Jones. And what a cast. Yes. Uh, we'll go over to you. How about your number five? My number five is a film from a very small director, Domino, by Brian mm. De Palma. Great I pick. know very little besides the synopsis I read quite a while ago, and I was excited. I felt illustrious. At such revelations that Brian De Palma's releasing a film this year. Oh, yeah. And I, I just can't wait to review it on the show. <laughs> I know. So I, fun. I just kind of thought he had retired. And I did, all of a sudden thought, I saw he had a new movie coming out. I was like, what? This is dope. Yeah, it's like Francis Ford Coppola releasing a movie. You're like, what? Oh, yeah. yeah, you do that. Pretty sweet. Great to have him back. My number five, we just talked about it, Gaspar Noe's Climax. Yes. Not much more to add. So you're even more excited about it than I am. Yeah. I mean, the order, you know, on these things is, you know, in flux, you know, as oh, trailers no, mine drop. Oh, is perfect. Wow. <laughs> Set in stone. <laughs> Set in stone. Carved. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm at the top of a mountain here. I'm pretty pumped. You know, I think these, my relationship with, with movies and my anticipation for it, like, is just constantly changing you know as i hear what other people think and as i and see new things more. get revealed and yeah yeah for sure but uh yeah as of right now it's pretty high how about so you our next four are gonna be the exact same i imagine right 
Because there's only because four there are perfect four movies. right answers. Yeah, right. exactly. There's four right answers. You get it. You get right. it. Right. So my number four, which is the correct answer, is Martin Scorsese's The Irishman. Ooh, nice. Hopefully, like it's late, right? Like kind of a December release, probably. I think it, yeah, I think it's a November Netflix release that we'll be able yeah. to watch at the Crest. Yeah. There you go. I take it it's not yeah. on your list the way that you're uh, kind of grimacing. Oh no, I, I, I don't mean to grimace. Um, I would just say if I had to pick like two auteurs that are universally kind of beloved that for me, like I've never just really found my way into, it'd be the Coen brothers and, and Scorsese. Well, um, that's because we haven't done the Gangs of New York for the podcast yet. That's true. Which, yeah, that would actually be a nice pairing, right? He's yeah. Returning to the gangster stuff. Uh, yeah. Love it. Good pick. We got it planned out. What is your number four? My number four <laughs> is Black Mother. Directed by Kalik Allah, which uh, is a documentary, my only documentary on the list. Um, this premiered at uh, New Directors, New Films last year. Um, I've liked a lot of movies that came out of that festival. I think they have really interesting programming. Um, I watched a trailer for it. It feels very much in the vein of, say, Hale County That's this morning, this evening. It. This was talked about on the Cinephiliacs podcast um, with the woman who had worked in Jamaica on film, I think. Oh, is that right? I, I didn't I know that they'd so. already talked I about it. I heard of this um, loosely. Yeah, it's got 100% on Rotten Tomatoes, 4 out of 5 from Time Out Magazine. Yeah, that's, the, that's quite uh, the selection. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, the plot synopsis is, From red light districts to lush rainforests, Black Mother is a loving and lyrical ode to Jamaica and its people, a visual poem that is at once deeply felt, a, de- a deeply felt love letter and ecstatic street corner prayer. Um, yeah, just going off the fact that people like it, um, I think the trailer is just kind of uh, stunning. Um, I think it looks really interesting. And I wanted to get a doc on What would you compare it to? Hale County, for sure. Okay. Um, maybe camera person as well, in the sense that he, um, it looks like he's mainly worked as a cinematographer. Well, what about um, um, fictional films that y- you'd think mm. of visually? Oof. Because um, just looking at the still photo, I started getting images of Florida Project, and I was like, of course you're picking this. Oh, no. I mean, no. it's a little more kind of experimental in its look, so I don't oh, know okay. that I have a good... Um, feature to really compare it to um he's kind of running through clips of what looks almost kind of just look like you know moving street photography and that kind of thing um but uh yeah visually very striking how about you my number three is now yeah we're on number three now right uh did you already give us your number four yep then we're on number three yes we had switched to order yeah, yeah, yeah yeah um all right Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. How can you not have it on there? That's right. Any release date for that one yet? Uh, no, I think that it is July 17th. Ooh, but I know nice. that it okay. has room to navigate because Sony's doing whatever they can to, to keep Tarantino in their grasp. Mm. This yeah. is going to be his first film post-Weinstein. So yeah. um, the distribution rights are very, you know, um, it, it will be a focal point. Yeah. seeing how it does business wise and and that investment thing yeah yeah um i have heard that there are permanent plans in the works as well for him to make that star trek film a rated star trek no no way wow yeah. i didn't know that so that's interesting just keeping you up to date good pick I like your it. number three my number three another one that we did first impressions for which is peter strickland's in fabric yes which i think looks bizarre and weird and very fresh. Um, Which is very interesting because you just watched a film that I would liken to this style and did not respond mm-hmm. well to it. And we'll talk about it in a little bit. It's ah. called Velvet Buzzsaw. Yeah. And th- that'll be interesting to, mm. to compare the two once we get it can. Get yeah. There. Yeah. I mean, t- to me, I think Velvet Buzzsaw has a little bit more of a broad appeal um, yeah. with its cast. Um, but yeah, I, I, I could see the connections there for sure. Yeah. Um, so my number two and the correct number two is also your number two, of course, Steven Soderbergh's The Laundromat. Mm. Oh yeah. He has a big year. He has a great year lined up for us all. Uh, is that a Netflix title too? That is a Netflix title. Nice. It has, uh, huge actors 
I only remember Meryl Streep and Antonio Banderas off of the top of my head. But uh, let's do a quick search on the phone here. Get some more depth. Gary Oldman, Alex Pettifer, David Schwimmer, mm. Nonzo Anozi, Robert Patrick, also known as that Terminator from The Terminator. Oh. The liquid guy. Mm. Will Forte. And Nikki Amuka Bird. Quite the cast. That's quite the cast for a Soderbergh picture. It is. It is. He normally doesn't work with so many actors. Yeah. Of acting quality. Normally he likes yeah. to have a lot more real people. Is it a heist movie? I don't know anything about it. The Laundromat is about the Panama Papers. Do you oh, remember the Panama okay. Papers? Uh, vaguely? Yeah. The, yeah. Where Leonardo DiCaprio and Tom Brady were implicated in yeah. offshore trading or the like. Yeah. I don't know. I, I tried not to learn any. I'll let the movie teach me. Yeah. I couldn't give you any of the details. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Boy. So gotta have him on there. Gotta have it. What's your right. number two? My number two the is... The uh, of course. It is. The Laundromat? No. <laughs> it is not The Laundromat, sadly. It's a foreign film. It just hasn't gotten U.S. distribution, so you can take me to task for it, release date-wise. Um, but it's uh, Long Day's Journey Into Night, directed by By Gone. Um, it's his follow-up to uh, a 2016 film called Kylie Blues, which I very much liked. Um... The plot synopsis is, a man went back to Gizu, found in the tracks of a mysterious woman. He recalls the summer he spent with her 20 years ago. Um, so is this a remake? I don't believe so. There is an older film, but I think they're unrelated as far as okay. I know. Okay. Because um, um, it is based on a book. That's why I was wondering. Yeah. Um, so maybe it's just an original interpretation of that you know like the way we have all these great gatsby interpretations now they're yeah completely different than the great gatsby but it still has to do with you know daisy or the light at the end of the dock or whatever yeah. you want to yeah. say um described yeah, it a as a uh, eugene o'neill actually not a book my bad gotcha yeah described as kind of a dreamy film noir premiered at can last year it was a big hit in china um playing at sif here in seattle in the northwest film forum in march um uh, I'm very interested. Yes, it is receiving quite the praise. Yeah. 88% on Rotten, or Meta, 89 on Rotten. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's good. Yeah, I mean, maybe if there was any theme with my list, it was partly just that, maybe partly because of, like, AMC A-List in 2018, um, did just drive me towards, um, a lot of American film, just because, uh, you know, the foreign films that we do get in seattle are more likely to go to the independent theaters which i didn't go to as much because of the amc list so i am kind of like just well, ready there, for there some more variety i guess foreign films at the uh, amc 10 we just saw mm. them earlier now that mm. the oscars have nominated all the foreign films are going through distribution to that AMC. if they get if they get a nom yeah that definitely yeah. helps yeah um it seems like that's the only way to make worldwide distribution profits on those foreign films in america um my number one is Steven Soderbergh's High Flying mm. Bird. Woo wee! This will be the first iPhone film on Netflix that I'm aware of shot for Netflix. Um, he's requested that they do not give it any cinema distribution. He does not want mm. any cinema distribution. And it is just a straight up procedural type film about mm. um, some legal working going ons in the NBA. Um, mm -hmm. I can't remember if it's a lockout season or what exactly the issue is, but it comes out very, very soon. And the reason it's my most anticipated film is because if he proves that you can make a great procedural basic genre type of a film on an iPhone and mm -hmm. get a good review and get seen by a lot of people, then the formula of the, the proven formula of Hollywood will be slightly shirked. Mm. and i'm i'm very interested to see that development because he did do two marketing experiments with unsane and logan lucky which didn't work out at all yeah yeah um yeah those were both amazon experiments that didn't go out so well well, so. well he was experimenting with marketing actually um yeah yeah they were yeah they were financed by amazon um so yes. i think he was disenfranchised and now he's jumping ship Try Netflix yeah. instead. Well, well, I mean, he's been pretty open about what his goal was with both those films. He wanted mm -hmm. he wanted to prove that you didn't have to market a film mm -hmm. um, with hundreds of millions of dollars to get eyes on it. 
Um, and he, he did social network advertising. That's where he spent like $100,000 or something. And then he spent $200,000 on select TV spots that he thought would mm. be good. And he proved himself wrong. Yeah. He's very open about that. Like, that's all him. He blames yeah. himself 100% for those failings. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, he, I think his approach with the iPhone, I think, is pretty different from, like, Sean Baker's approach, where I think, I, I mean, I, when I watch Unsane, I feel like Soderbergh's constantly reminding me that it's shot with an iPhone. Yes. Um, whereas Sean Baker's proving you can create, you know, um, something beautiful and not know that it's on an iPhone. Um, that's what really? I, that's the sense that I got. When you watched um, Tangerine, you didn't get the sense that it was a very portable lens. Getting some of those shots. Portable, yeah, but um, I don't know that like I don't know that I would have guessed it was an iPhone necessarily when I watched Tangerine. I definitely knew that going in. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I think that yeah, I find it might be the same way. Whereas I'm hoping Unsane so. Was very yeah. much, you know, security film voyeurist on purpose filtering yeah you know it, that was the agenda <laughs> yeah yeah which on the cinephiliacs um i know that made labuza's list yes it did and i think he called it delightfully ugly yes which i, I might just him. call it ugly but <laughs> we'll see i'm yeah. hoping yeah we'll see i i understand why you would find it ugly and i understand why he finds it beautifully ugly and why yeah. i find it beautiful because it's yeah. ugly <laughs> oh there you go <laughs> Uh, my number one is An Elephant Sitting Still, directed by Hubo, his first and last film, sadly. Um, now deceased. Nearly four hours long, uh, set over the course of a single day. Um, I think this will just scratch the same itch that Burning scratched for me. Um, you know, the ideas in Burning about the little hunger, the big hunger, all these kind of ambiguous, um... Uh, thematic touches, I think, feel very much of a kind with this idea of an elephant that sits still and ignores the world and these people have an interest in it. It's just my kind of mystery. Uh, yeah, it's tied to mystery. A Eastern religion that I don't remember. It's not Buddhism. Um, right? There is a specific Eastern religion that this is about, correct? I don't know. The elephant standing still. We'll have to do it once it, we know when it's coming out and can see it in theaters. Yeah. I'll do a deep dive because I'm pretty sure that it's it's based in in at least a mythos of uh, Eastern mm. Asian um, meaning that goes back thousands of years. If I oh remember yeah, correctly. Yeah. Um, One of their uh, March foundation yeah. myths. If I yeah. Correctly. Uh, if IMDb is accurate, March is when okay. we'll get it. So. Um, there we go. Keep an eye on the Grand Illusion, the yeah. Northwest Film Forum, and SIF. Exactly right. <clears throat> All right. Well, now we have to get to our opening film of 2019. Well, your opening film, I Suffered Through Escape Room. Ooh. Uh, we're Off talking to a good about start. Glass. And yet, it is true. My bones break easily. I've had 94 breaks in my life. But you have an extraordinary IQ. This is not a cartoon. This is the real world. No way. And yet, some of us still don't die with bullets. Some of us can still bend steel. I've been waiting for the world to see that we exist. M. Night Shyamalan's Glass. That's right. So where are you at on Unbreakable? Mm. I saw Unbreakable years ago, but years after it came out. It, it came out in the 90s, right? Uh, 99? Yeah, so I don't know. I saw it maybe 10 years ago. Okay. Um, and I haven't revisited it recently. Um, Did you like it? Uh, yeah, it was decent. I remember being mildly positive on it. It's Would not you... one that I hold... Uh, I hold dear to my heart, but I remember enjoying it for sure. What do you think of Split? I was a little more mixed on Split. Um, I think I gave it a, a three. So positive, but um, not one that uh, really um, stuck with me or that I had a great deal of fun with, but decent. What about decent you? For uh, both. I loved Unbreakable. I watched it when yeah. I was a kid. It makes mm. a big difference when, you know, you're, geez, I was probably 11 when I first saw it. Um on VHS at home and Bruce mm. Willis was Bruce Willis. 
you know mel gibson was in the patriot and bruce willis was shooting people these are uh, important factors jean claude van damme was kicking people in the face and kurt russell was still a badass that was murdering people in science fiction films mm. with chains i enjoyed it immensely i thought it Love was it. so cool yeah and and i liked split when it came out i thought that james mcavoy's performance was the closest i've seen him contend with his um only competition of his generation which is michael fassbender i still mm. think fassbender is a better actor but that was the first time i saw mcavoy really break his shell open since filth probably mm. um and and do something really exciting and i there's moments of that in class that mm. are its best moments to me mm. um and then on glass i did not like it how about you, you? yeah i was not crazy about it um it felt like an easy enough way to pass the time because i think it moves pretty quickly it's pretty brisk um i wasn't bored but i was not uh thrilled by any means um wow we're gonna disagree really i was bored ah okay and i was also not thrilled (laughs) so two no's but uh yeah when when you realize that she's telling bruce willis that he doesn't have powers Mm -hmm. and then he has a huge water cage around him Mm -hmm. to suppress his power Mm. i was like (laughs) what who the fuck signed off on the writing of this yeah who who wrote this i think that my my Mm. review was um shyamalan should have requested a script doctor and uh Mm. Jason Bloom should have insisted on one. Yeah. Because, oh, yeah, this is Blumhouse? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Blumhouse production. Yeah. yeah. Because Split, he self-financed, actually, completely himself, M. Night did. And then yeah. um, that way he got a huge significant amount of the money back from Split when it was airing because distribution was just done by Blumhouse. Yeah. Whereas they co-produced this one and yeah, it proved to be bad. Yeah, yeah. I mean, on one hand, I do kind of like the style. I think visually it has some personality. You know, the the pink hospital walls, Samuel L. Jackson's kooky jacket. Um, yeah, After Earth I, had personality. Pardon? After Earth had personality. What's After Earth? That's oh, is that him. the Will Smith one? Yeah, that's Will and Jaden Smith. No, I did not film. see that one. Oh, yeah, I, I mean, I would, I mean. The Last Airbender had personality. You know, I've seen yeah, all of his yeah. films. I'll put it that yeah. way. Yeah, and, and I'll, I, I will always take that over something that's just. Um, you know, boringly familiar. Like I did that. Like, oh, okay, this looks kind of different. Um, nifty might be a good word for nifty, it. Nifty, yeah. And the cinematography is kind of decent. Um, Definitely. Personally, with James McAvoy, I kind of felt the same way I did with Split, which is that I kind of feel like I, I, I like the performance, but on one hand, it just it also just feels like a lot of acting, and I kind of wonder if like the return on investment is a little limited because of how it's kind of being channeled. Um, I think it's kind of a director's fault when a, a performance is is hindered by how it's being used. Um, I just don't think the Beast is that exciting of a character. I mean, I kind of wish that, like, every time he goes into Beast mode, which is just a ridiculous phrase, um, that it was more exciting. Like, I to watch him crawl on the walls and stuff, uh, I'm just never that thrilled by that which i guess you could argue oh yeah that's the point like these aren't supposed to be you know iron man or batman but to me it's still got to be cool i don't know to to me the cool part about james mcavoy's character isn't that he goes beast it's the tortured guy holding all these people together yeah that's what's cool it's no single manifestation that's cool to me other than maybe the 12 year old hedwig yeah who likes lollies um, yeah, he's like my favorite character, probably of mm. all the characters. But it's it's just that this character was written and can be depicted with all these personalities, mm. and no one's going. Well, that just is unreasonable because it doesn't it, like it fits to the point where I believe this character in this world does have this problem, mm. which is not something that any old movie could get away with. Yeah, I would say that's yeah. maybe the nicest thing I have to say about this movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Any dissatisfaction I have with the performance, um, I do not blame on James Mac- James McAvoy. I blame kind of on Shyamalan for just like prohibiting me from being able to 
kind of like focus on the performance because I so don't like what else is going on around it. You yeah. know, it's just hard to kind of view it in a vacuum. Um, I might, but uh, I found myself wishing for what's her name, Josephine Decker. Ooh yeah, just doing a a piece on um, oh my gosh on him, just a mm. like a thirty minute acting piece and just a a warehouse like that yes. warehouse that we're in. And just mm. all it is is acting. Yeah, it's, his name's Kevin, right? <clears throat> Kevin. Kevin's Kevin. Yeah, <laughs> I, that would be a good movie. I'd watch right. that. Um, yeah, another problem with this, it got a bad performance out of Anya Taylor Joy. Was my uh, experience, which breaks my heart. It got a bad performance out of Sarah Paulson. Um, yeah, I didn't. I, I didn't uh, dislike it. It felt very f- kind of familiar. It was it, just really badly written. Um, yeah, I. I've made the um, the glutting joke a few times that the movie is a sham. Mm. Parentheses rock. Ooh, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Nicely done. It's I I just dislike this movie. Yeah, completely. Yeah, man, watching Anya Taylor Joy have to, um, you know, appear so emotionally invested in Kevin, I that just for, never worked for what, me. Either. For seven minutes of screen time yeah i just thought it was silly i just didn't that just didn't pass the smell test for me of believability the the son mm. barely passed the smell test once they introduced mm. samuel jackson's mom it's like the smell test is over <laughs> you know, like, it just smells it just bad. reeks in here <laughs> yeah which i think is the same kid who was in unbreakable right yes yes same, yeah same boy yeah um you saw this in theaters mm-hmm. uh, abroad or here uh abroad okay yeah. Yeah. how was that um theater uh they were pretty quiet i don't know i, I didn't well, get when, uh, when you left did they was there a general sense uh, it's hard no one's speaking english so that didn't help but, but um the film was in english uh yeah with french subtitles okay okay yeah yeah but people were speaking french so i didn't pick up any um quips about it being good or bad okay. um but i also didn't get the vibe that people were particularly gripped you know there's something about when you see people you know um freely eating their popcorn drinking their drinks versus just being hooked on the screen these people were kind of like meh Meh. it's a movie i guess they're having fun but they're not particularly into it what about you i went to the premiere night at the Mm. uh the oak tree and basically every single guy that had brought his girlfriend or wife with him was apologizing at the end of the film saying, I didn't know it would be this bad Mm. or stupid. And, uh, uh, one, one girl was like, that's not what you wanted. Is it? Mm. And he's like, no, this sucked. This really hurt. (laughs) What a nice girlfriend. Is this what you wanted, baby? (laughs) Is this what you like? (laughs) Yeah. She's, Gen, you know, maybe they're just getting started dating. Like, are you you really like this? Like, yeah. I might need to. Get we may out have of here. a problem. That's hilarious. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it seems like basically everyone was let down by it. Some mm-hmm. people like it. I think that the argument that I've heard the most is that it's shirking superhero expectations and therefore is artistic and has value. Is a very weak argument for the problems that are rampant in the film Mm. while that idea is a very cool idea. And I look forward to James Gray's take on that in 2021. Mm. Most (laughs) definitely. Yeah. I mean, you you can shirk expectations, but you still have to be good. I don't know. Just basic kind of coherence and, uh, Mm, yes. Understandable drama where, I don't know. It just, it just didn't, it just didn't cohere. It didn't click. And, it's an overall bad movie. The yeah. End? We are shitting on it. Yeah. <laughs> you might like it. Um, now, um, a much more debatable film. Ooh. Serenity. Good to see you, John. It took so long to find you. What do you say? Say I'm not called John anymore. Sometimes we do bad things for good reasons. Directed by Stephen Knight, starring Matthew McConaughey, Anne Hathaway, Diane Lane. I forget the fellow who plays the bad bad boy. Hunsu? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Kyle Chandler? No, not Kyle Chandler. Shit. Kyle Chandler's brother in like nine films. Yes. <laughs> 
Yeah, good as that guy's name. I don't remember his name. He has a pretty big hole. Drunk Jason. man. <laughs> Jason Clark. Jason Clark, that's his name, yes. Yes. And also, Jeremy Strong. You didn't say his name, did you? Jeremy, who, who does he play? The Sun Manifestation. Ah, uh, yes, okay. Wow, I didn't even realize that was him. Got it. Yeah. He's uh, in an HBO show as well that's really, really good. Nice. I I, norm, I didn't even that didn't even click that that was him. Normally, I think I like him. Um, yeah, I was not so crazy about this one. What about you? I was let down. It's been four years, five years mm. since Locke. Mm-hmm. Um, one of my favorite single rumors, arguably, even though he's in a car of all time. Um, and th- you know, it sh- was bad mm. generally. Um, but it was creative. Mm. Yeah. Um, it was well acted. My problems are basically all screenplay and camera. Mm. Yeah. And especially the special effects. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it was within five, six, seven minutes that I felt something was off. You know, we. The first thing we see is. Well, the is intro is. A we, dead giveaway. We see the eye of a small boy. The camera goes through his eye into the ocean and then leaps out like a dolphin. But on the way through, we see faces in mm-hmm. the iris. Mm-hmm. Um, but right off the bat, I was like, whoa, that was a little silly. But okay, okay. And then we're on the boat. Matthew McConaughey's fishing. I'm a little excited again because this feels more like the trailer. Which I it thought was a great like, trailer. I still think that's one of the best sound designs I've ever seen. In I agree. Day. Fantastic. I'm like, okay, okay, we're good, we're good. Then we start our Moby Dick. Yes, I was like, huh, is this, this going to be about fishing? I, I did not I see this coming. I would have enjoyed it if it was about fishing. <laughs> but within those two minutes where he, he hooks the big one, and there's this transition from him like getting the vest on and getting hooked up to then him all of a sudden, or, or pretty suddenly being like drenched in sweat holding on for dear life i'm like whoa like this was this was kind of a jarring switch for for him to go from the the calm meditative state to well he brandishes a knife in between them yeah i i don't know right off the bat i was like this this is um a little clunky yeah um and i just feel like that kind of continued it was like like it was um, a video game are you saying this was this was purposeful? Yeah. Yeah, I would definitely mm-hmm. argue it's purposeful. Yeah, I mean... And that it doesn't serve it well. But yeah. I, I certainly think it's purposeful. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I think you're right. I think there there was something that was intended to feel off, but I found it just very, very, very unpleasant. Well, once the fish gets free and we go back to land, we're just inculcated with wrong wrongings i guess might be the word where we hear um whatever the name of the island is is the radio station and you're now listening Mm. to the island radio station Mm -hmm. and then um you know the the light repeats itself um everything is named after the island that there's only one bar you walk into Mm -hmm. the bar the the guy that is always at the bar in the noir films is at the bar playing cards with himself it's uh it's this i honestly knew what the twist was without having been told what the twist was about at that 15 minute mark yeah and then the rest of it was just kind of me holding my temples trying to appreciate Anne Hathaway and McConaughey act yeah yeah I mean I guess I would make the distinction between the idea that something is meant to be off because it in fact is in the world of the film and the fact that like tonally things feel off like to me this felt more like a group of talented musicians, to use an analogy, each good at their instruments, but Playing never... Playing separate tracks without any conversation about what you want the track to sound like. Never managing to actually play a song yeah. together. Um, I just felt like Matthew McConaughey and Anne Hathaway each fine. I just felt like they were in different movies. Um, Definitely. And uh, Diane Lane's character... That was kind of like a nothing character. I didn't understand why she was even there. It just felt um... I did because I play video games. Mm. But <laughs> I don't know. It didn't... She's the NPC with the quest. That's kind of what you come to understand throughout the film. 
her mm. cat is always missing. The player character is supposed to go get the cat and bring it back to her. And yeah. then you get a reward either sexually or financially from her. Yeah, but again, it's it's tone. It's the fact that I'm not thinking to myself, ooh, what's going on here? It's that, oof, this feels not smooth. You know, it's about, like, how you kind of transition those feelings between yeah, it's something. Rough. Yeah, And, like, it's not that it's even visually rough. It's just somewhere between the writing the lighting and the directing it's a lot <laughs> it has a, uh, a a tonal like an atmospheric tonal break i like, agree like the sound isn't in the same world as the visuals and the yeah. lighting isn't part of either of them yeah but they're yeah. all present on the screen all the time because that's mm -hmm. how you project the film yeah so to it, me it just it clashes just, yeah. yeah um and it's like it's a I like the meta idea of the screenplay. I agree. It's a it's a nifty idea, um, and that's about like that's yeah. all, all there is to like. It's a great idea. Sure, take a couple passes, but don't make it. Yeah, yeah. It's weird how you know there can be movies you write low because they're well made, but you don't like what they're doing. Yeah. Versus a movie where I'm kind of okay with what this is trying to do. It just didn't work at all. Um, uh. And it's a bummer. I was excited. Um, what was I about to say? Um, oh, yeah, we were talking about vi the visual style. Those little, like, fast motion whip pans kind of around the characters. I just recoiled. I was like, it just doesn't look good to me. I don't like it. Um, which is, maybe that's personal. I don't know that I can be that objective about that. I just, I'm like, I don't like it. It just feels tacky to me. There's a lot of other things that bother me. Like, how how good that... Th there were moments that were so good that I couldn't believe how bad the movie was. Mm. One of which was when he gets in his truck, when he's beginning... I, I guess the table scene was good, I think, at night with um, the um, salesman with the briefcase. Oh. Mm -hmm. When he finally has that confrontation. I think that, that was a good scene. And then the follow-up to that, when he drives his truck out into the middle of the field, mm. um, parks it in the road, and then runs through the corn i mm. thought that was also really good like that looked like a full frame mm. to me that was thought out like it was all part of the same concept and the same meaning behind him do doing this choice so like it all meshed there and it mm. reminded me of how nothing had meshed since they got <laughs> off the boat in the beginning just makes everything relatively worse it, exactly yeah and it just kept happening yeah uh yeah one thing that I, that did come to mind is we we had watched that film from American turned French filmmaker the heist film where he takes her into the room and hits her with the belt uh Rafifi Rafifi yes, yes. and then oh. with what mm. happens with Anne Hathaway I was like see Michael mm. this is what I was talking oh. about <laughs> that's an interesting connection nice I yeah, like that that's what I was thinking like that that character uh what's his, what's that actor's name again Jason Clark. Jason Clark. Jason Clark to me is the same as mm. the uh, um, Andy Garcia character in Rafifi. Mm. <clears throat> I could see that. Yeah, and again, you know, I think kind of in isolation, I think he's okay. Um, but he's so sort of kind of one dimensionally villainous that it's almost like a kid made him up. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, again, you could say that that's the point, but I mean, it still has to be tonally pleasant and. I think there are many, many other films out there that can kind of do a mashup of genres in a more kind of cohesive way. Yeah. Um, but uh, Also known as this film is a swing and miss. I would agree. Just kind of a bummer. I mean, I hope there that are just ones... makes another one quick. Yeah. There are ones that you really just want to like, even if you don't. This is one of those where I was like, if we If we wouldn't have already seen it, it would have been on my top films that I'm excited yeah. for this year. I agree. Talk about a letdown. Mar yeah, talk about a gap between the the trailer and what we got. And do you Man. remember when it was actually marketed back in October? Yeah, it wasn't marketed at all before this release. Yeah, they really yeah. got screwed <laughs> big time. Yeah, uh, McConaughey kind of stumbled with White Boy Rick. That didn't do well. This didn't do well. Beach bum. Fingers crossed. Oh, he gets back on that horse. Beach bum is going to do business. I agree. <laughs> That's the uh, that's the comeback. That's the comeback. Um, I could use a refill. How about you? Let me down this. 
Critique is so limiting and emotionally draining. I'm hoping you find something to explain what's happening. Which one's better, one or two? Better or worse, no different. No different. I'm quite curious to know what you think. I think sober hasn't been good for him. Pierce was in the full bloom of alcoholism here. Exactly. Never should have quit drinking. No originality. No courage. My opinion. Bzzz. Velvet Buzzsaw. Dan Gilroy. Did you like Nightcrawler? I love Nightcrawler. Yeah? Love it. Big fan. And you like Jake Gyllenhaal? Big fan of Jake. Me too. Big fan. Big fan of Renee Rousseau. Big fan of Tony Collette. Oh, yeah. Um, pretty decent fan of Natalie Dyer. Huge fan of um, Superstar in, in the Making, Billy Magnuson. That's right. I thought of you when he appeared. Yes. Natalie um, Dyer, who is she? Um, she is the person who continues to find dead people. Ah, got it. She is um, the older sister in the television show Stranger Things. Got it. Yeah. <clears throat> oh. Wow, yeah, I didn't even think of that that was her. I kept thinking that was Noelle Wells for a lot of it. I did, too. The difference is about 12 years, probably. Really? Age gap. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. that Noelle's, makes sense, actually. I think in her 30s, yeah. That is a huge gap. How do they look so similar? That's crazy. Noelle's aging. I'm not going to lie. I thought that I was Noelle Wells until right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, when it opened, I thought it was Noelle Wells, and I was like, that's not Noelle Wells. That's that other girl yeah. who looks like Noelle Wells. Definitely right. Uh, didn't go on SNL. <laughs> yes, exactly. They didn't make Mr. Roosevelt. Yes. Um, yeah, I think this is kind of the opposite experience I had with something like Serenity, where I think it, it felt very kind of well put together, but I don't know that I really liked it, what it was ultimately trying to do. Um, you and everyone else? Yeah, I, I love this cast. Uh, I thought Jake Gyllenhaal was great. Um, I thought Renee, Renee Russo was great. I thought, uh, oh, John Malkovich was actually pretty funny yes, in was. his relatively small role. Even David Dix was good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was funny. That's actually one of my favorite moments when Jake Gyllenhaal and his girlfriend are breaking up and he's in the background yeah. of the shot going in like, the kitchen. oh, shit, something <laughs> like that. Um, he's funny. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's satirical. It's, um, I would definitely say that that is what it mostly is yeah and then the well you know you you say more because you knew nothing going in right yeah i i read on the reddit threads the day the trailer came out Mm -hmm. um that you shouldn't watch the trailer if you don't want it spoiled got it so i knew nothing about it besides the art scene yeah netflix release and that i was watching it right after i watched elite battle angel at midnight Mm. so I went from a bad movie to what I consider to be a great movie. Wait, you watched, a, you started this at midnight? I started this at midnight on Thursday. <sighs> Got it, okay. Uh, Alita Battle Angel ended at 10, went to the bar, had some drinks with a friend who came down for that screening, uh, the press screening or whatever, and then, boom, ran back home, started it right at 12. Oh, yeah, started it at midnight. All yeah. right, it launched at midnight, I guess, yep. that makes sense. Um, and, uh... You know, it could have been some of those liquors talking that I'd had at the bar. Mm. But I like this movie a yeah. lot. I Love think it. that it is a great piece of satire um, that is constantly retroactively folding in on itself and criticizing mm. even itself for being critical while mm. criticizing so many other things. And the the one... So this one criticism about the film that I think is very interesting is the people that are complaining about how David Diggs and John Malkovich just leave the picture. Mm. Where to me, those are the people that came the closest to this evil monstrosity of the art scene. They came close to it and then they left. Mm. And um, the act of leaving is a complete and total separation where they don't ever come back into the film. Mm. um, Unless we're talking about the credits with John Malkovich. Mm. Yeah. Which yeah. I, it just it worked for me on so so mm. many intellectual levels. Not to sound pretentious, mm. but it just I kept noticing um, allegories and metaphors and and things mm. about how this applies to this, and that yeah. applies to filmmaking and film criticism and art criticism and literature mm. criticism. Like there's always something happening. Yeah, and then um, you know the art that you even put on your body, killing you. Uh, mm. You know, there's 
lo- loads and loads of allegorical um, jokes that I just enjoy immensely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you know, on one hand, I think it's it's kind of effective satire in the sense that it's kind of heightening that which it wants to expose, right? It's kind of heightening their their greed, their soullessness. Everyone's you know kind of got a fl- got a pretty clear flaw. But it's kind of that added step that it's not just aiming to expose what it has a, a problem with, but it, you know it's going to punish them for it. That I kind of feel like it created s- straw men for himself. Like you never even really gave these characters a chance um, to reveal any humanity. I mean, I kind of feel like he he made it easy for himself. If if it were just you know straight satire where he were he was just heightening these these elements of the characters to expose them and then kind of left that to me, but he's coming down so um, forcefully in, in punishing them that like, I never got that excited because I was like, well, yeah, like they never, they never had a chance to really re- redeem themselves. And I don't know that he, it ever felt that observationally revealing about these characters. Like, I don't know that I ever thought to myself, wow, that is so right about, these these people um it, it just didn't feel that revelatory despite... I, I think i get what you're saying you're saying that they were real characters to you that never became real characters yeah he's he's saying aren't gotcha. these people bad you know to me they get what they're... they deserve i'm like well yeah but like you didn't make them you you didn't make them that complex so you think that they're all bad not not everyone. I don't want to make that broad of a generalization. I mean, I think um, John Malkovich is an artist, and I think that's why he doesn't get punished, right? He's not profiting off... I mean, he, he does, but he is not... He's creating the art. He's not exploiting it like most of these others who do get punished are are doing. <laughs> and I think that makes sense, and probably the same with... Uh, David. David Deeks. He's the... the kind of conceptual artist right well he yeah he, he does the, he's part the of the sets. um, um right. i think he does what he does i don't remember what his exact pieces are but i know that he's part of the collectivist right art society when he stops doing the capitalist right um, right um i i i think i understand and can even sympathize with your complaints it's just to me um there is a way to make movies metaphorical and i'm very Mm. attracted to those films see mother um Mm. and this to me was an allegorical metaphorical film in which there are just Mm. stand-in characters that seem Mm. very real but they're just stand-ins for the way that people behave in the commonplace Mm. and i think that some of the small tinges to character work like jake gyllenhaal being the the person who is um in charge of what becomes worth value mm. not realizing that Rene Rousseau is completely in control mm-hmm. of what he finds value in and is mm-hmm. selling it before he even writes his piece and owns his ex-boyfriend I believe it is yeah um, yeah it, it I, it's perfect to me in the way that it's criticizing allegorically that like you think you're free to make these criticisms as a critic mm-hmm. when really you don't understand that everything that you're criticizing is also coming from that other it's just a different avenue of creation that that is allowing you your criticisms you know yeah. like like when yeah. we look at who signs our paychecks or or whatever from our day jobs you know and then we're going and criticizing stuff from people that are working really really hard like the hobo man yeah y- you know yeah. it's just to me that is he a is real a person <laughs> delicious amount of reality i think the hobo man is a real person to all of us <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah i mean i do think jake gyllenhaal was probably the most interesting character to me maybe uh, billy th- magnuson uh, on a ladder with airpods telling you that he's deeper <laughs> than you'd think isn't a, a great character come on he was good he was good um i mean Tony i think Collette's he's dreams of grandeur yes I, I think Jake Gyllenhaal's character is the most sort of interesting to, to dissect in terms of whether or not you think he is soulless or not. I mean, I think to me, he he does, um, I, I think he does have a genuine interest in the art, but he also doesn't have a lot of backbone. We see him kind of um, flip-flop when he hears someone else say, 
a work that he at first thought was good actually be bad and he says oh yeah i completely agree um and what are you talking about the uh sober years comment exactly okay. kind of early on yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, um, look at look at your own list earlier when you say you know you could flip flop on on this title for uh, oh, Ad yeah, Astra yeah. for Claire Denis. Yeah, know, yeah, like, yeah. To to me, it's that allegory where it's like we even just did this just now. It's something yeah, that yeah. applies. You know, to me, that's not a straw man if it's something that can be a universal truth. Yeah, I guess they're it, they just didn't feel human enough for it to really. Um, feel universal. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that I really like a recognize these of characters. Characters that are ideas, more mm-hmm. than a collection of characters that are people that woke up and have traumatic experiences from their child. You, you know, it definitely doesn't bring yeah. that sensitivity to it. But I, I think that it, you don't always have to make a, a film in that way to make a, a good film. Yeah, I mean, I, my contention. I think it's if I try to like try to abstract a little bit more to like get to what the essence is, it's maybe just kind of the, the form relative to the content. Like if, if, if all of these sort of behaviors weren't quite so heightened and this felt a little bit more like drama rather than satire, I might have been a little bit in, more invested when they get their comeuppance. Mm-hmm. But as um, sort of creations, um, it just felt like he was setting up the pieces just to kind of knock them down. Um, I don't know. I kind of like to watch art killing metaphor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, God, I mean, great cast. I mean, uh, Tony Collette actually, maybe I've talked about Jake Gyllenhaal. She was maybe my favorite. Um, it reminded me of, um, that, um, Zasha Lane, Nick Offerman, uh, don't remember the the daughter's character. Hearts beat loud. Mm. Reminded me of her role in Hearts Beat Loud, kind of mm. where she doesn't get to have that much, but she's screen stealing when she has it. Mm. Yeah, uh, when she's walking up to the sphere, the ball, and she kind of like giggles to herself as she's walking up to it. So is that when it so cuts confident. to her reflection being all bulbous in the sphere? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and that's just, you know, perfect that she can go from walking up serious to snickering to herself, then to having this kind of profound moment with the object. Like it all just it just moves so smoothly. Like it's just fun to watch her. Um and like I think I think it is well directed. Like it all sort of um feels well controlled. Um I think it's more about the aim rather than this the the moment to moment feel of it. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's still so early. I'll be interested to just, I haven't read that many takes on this, to be honest. I'll be interested to see what other people it, It's definitely think. getting poor reviews mm. overall, at least on Letterboxd. It's averaging between the one and a half to the two and a half from what I've right? seen. Yeah. Really? That's actually lower than I would have thought. I, uh, I think me and like two other people I saw had given it a four and a half. So. That's actually surprising <laughs> to me. Mm. But, um, yeah. I love Other it. Thoughts? You less so. Less so. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I really hope that. I, I mean, to me, this is like hold the dark, where I get not liking mm. it a lot. Like I absolutely understand not liking it, but I think that the vision holds true all the way through. It and that it is well directed, if not well written, for your taste. Mm. Um, just like hold the dark is well directed, if not well written, for someone's taste, and that these types of super artistic projects are getting done under the Netflix banner is great. And I hope Dan Gilroy makes another one because you know, all it takes is him to go back to the studio system to make those more normal pictures. Yeah. And I think that in retrospect, maybe films like this that aren't necessarily being enjoyed at the moment might have more import once he makes more films that are notable. Mm. Just for I'll his, let you have the final taste. words. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You liked it more than me. I always want to like something, so let's end it there. That's it. Let's uh, hop over to a little bit of science fiction. Yeah, that let's you do gave it. me for a Christmas assignment. That's right. Everyone else still not have service. I got zero. Yeah. On the news, you know, they're talking about the comet. Yeah, yeah. Miller's also, comet. After it passed, people get lost. They would end up in the wrong home. Why? And they keep telling people that this can happen. The chicken tastes like right. tuna. It must be science. Miller's comet. <laughs> The whole neighborhood is out. 
of power, uh, except for a house about two blocks up. Yeah, so we each exchanged two titles for Christmas. We did. It was on, I think the film, it's the film comment podcast that does this periodically where the three or four critics on there give each other titles to watch, which can be good ones or they can be terrible ones. And they're like, you suck, which is kind of fun. Um, So yeah, that's what we did. I gave you Coherence and Startup, which we'll talk about on another episode. You gave me two Nicholas. Blind Spots. That's right. Uh, Bronson and Valhalla Rising. That's right. Um, so coherence. Why did I give this to you? Um, you we haven't really talked about that much sci-fi on the show, but you have said before you like sci-fi. Sci-fi is um, one of my earliest and most favorite genres. Yeah, certainly. which in a very broad sense is kind of like a blind spot for me. Like I am in no way a sci-fi expert. Not not even expert. Like I'm just not that well versed on. You're not genre. a novice. Yet. No, no. <laughs> um, but. Uh, Coherence is one that, like, I have kind of a weird relationship because it's very rare that I just turn on Prime or Netflix and just surf for something. Like, I usually have kind of a sense for, like, two to five titles that I want to watch. But this is one that I had just stumbled on a couple years ago um, and that I liked kind of a bit or quite a bit. So I was interested to see as a more as more of a sci-fi aficionado what you would think. And I enjoyed it. I did enjoy it. Cool. It's not a perfect film by any means. I didn't like it as much as your rating has you liking it. Yeah. Um, but I do think it's a it's an incredibly strong screenplay, and it gets the most out of actors that I've never seen perform before. Yeah. So yeah, it, you all know, I'd, I'd say not. I don't mean this disparagingly, but B list actors. Yeah. S- star in this thing, and it is gripping in a in a way that I would liken to The Invitation, which is something oh, that yeah, I, yeah. I compared it to when you gave it to me. I was like, is this kind of like The Invitation? It looks yeah. kind of like The Invitation. And yeah. then I, I think you said it's more sci-fi. So in my head, I was like, okay, mm. so we're more like another mm-hmm. Earth with The Invitation. I get it. Mm. I get it. Yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I still don't know if, if timing-wise, the film works overall. Mm. I think it could have been shorter and tighter. I think it has you sit with the idea of the box mm. longer than it should have to capitalize on it. Not that mm. that's not that it did anything bad, but I I think that there's a way to make the timing faster where it has more impact and therefore mm. ends up feeling like a stronger film. Stronger punch. Yeah, yeah because this is all about the punch. Yeah. Um yeah, rather than being a film that works even if it's 5 hours long. Mm-hmm. That sounds terrible. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it, it has to punch, and I feel like it could have punched about eight minutes sooner mm. and just yeah. punched harder. Yeah, um, that makes sense. But I, I really like the premise of the box and putting the different things in and walking in through the darkness and and ending yeah. up in a in a different location. It's it's certainly a um a, a writer's screenplay. Yeah, exactly. That's ex- that's a great way to put it. Um, I'm kind of intrigued by sci-fi like this that's sci-fi in concept, but in style, they can't afford it, right? Like, mm-hmm. I think this is made for, like, $50,000, um, and I I think it's just um, a, pretty, a pretty good return on investment relative to the inexperienced uh, cast. Um, well, it's certainly a good picture. I have no idea what their distribution looks like if they're even making money off their distribution. Oh, yeah. That's screwed. That's always yeah. a, a separate discussion that I have to research. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's doing good business for that budget. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, to me, I mean, I, I am... We talk about budget sometimes. You know, when you see something that small have... For me, a decent punch work. It, it's kind of... It, it's, it's satisfying. Um, and, uh, I, I could absolutely see someone just be completely annoyed with the exposition. Like these are, these characters are talking about everything that they're experiencing, you know, as they experience it, like they're talking about Schrodinger's cat and the meteor that happened a hundred years ago. And, you know, it's all kind of dialogue, but to me, it just kind of passes the, the, the sniff test of these people being real people. Um, it definitely felt real to me because 
I would have been the one that knows about the Tunguska event, and I would have been the one trying to explain Schrodinger's at that party. Right. So right. I, I was, uh, I was definitely on board. I was like, I, I would be this guy that's like trying to project too much value into what's happening yeah. and trying to explain it to people that don't care. Yeah. <clears throat> um, there are just these tiny doses of humor that I think are funny. There's, you know the moment when it's revealed one guy has slept with another guy's wife and he says you know well unfortunately this happened prior to tonight so if there are a million realities occurring right now i've slept with your wife in every one of them Uh god that that stings um boom punch boom yeah and also the bathroom pretty funny yes when she beats the shit out of herself (laughs) definitely you know and the effects there they're cheap you know but but uh, it's so poorly lit that you can't tell. <laughs> it is true. <laughs> it's very true. And I don't mean that um, negatively. I mean, like, they lit with bad lighting really mm, well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I think it could have tipped its hand a little too far in terms of suggesting um, just what all these other realities might look like. Like, we know enough. We don't. I know. I feel like I know just enough about these characters to get a sense for what else what other paths these people might have taken like the the blonde gal comes with a boyfriend who's who dated somebody else at the dinner party um they're unstable you you just kind of picture that what these other realities might look like so it's really kind of sci-fi in how it just kind of gets your imagination going yeah it's definitely when we talk about the infinite amount of numbers between the number zero and the number one when Mm. we get into infinitesimal decimal numbers um that's where it's cool yeah, that's it's that type of a thought process or yeah. experiment, rather. Yeah, um, and uh, I kind of like the editing. You know, there are these there are these kind of cuts to black sometimes that um, between shots that just give it this little bit of an off kilter sense. That's one of the things in retrospect that I liked because every time it cut to black, we could have cut to black by going through the darkness barrier. And we could Mm. be in a different fucking house. Yes. With a different group of people that feel like the same group of fucking people. (laughs) Definitely. Yeah. And that's, that's where it gets into that infinitesimal (laughs) decimal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So, I mean, admittedly, I don't know that there's as much to talk about here because it's very one note. With yeah, a great punch. Yeah, yeah. Which I is mean, what I'd you say about it, the invitation. It's a gimmicky, and maybe. I love the invitation. Yeah, there's something about small indies that really value dinner parties because it, it just gets everybody in the same room. Yeah. Like, let's just get this going. It's affordable. <laughs> yeah, the catering for the scene can just be part of the scene. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Very economic. Yes. Um, Craft services. Put it on the fucking table. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I thought it'd be fun, but we have sci-fi spring coming. We do have the sci-fi coming. So I will be interested to see your suggestions. There will be probably quite a few rewatches for me, but Mm. yeah, it'll be, it'll be a fun selection. Um, You've never seen Britt Marling's Another Earth? I have not. I know you thought this was in that same vein, right? Especially the ending, yeah. Yeah. Not to spoil both, but very close ending wise. Um, Yeah. I, I would say that her sci-fi projects, for anyone that's seen Coherence or that now watches Coherence and likes it, any Brit Marling science fiction project you will love, whether mm. it's the OA or Another Earth, she is, I think, one of the most exciting down-to-earth science fiction writers mm. um, in in the screen format at the moment. Yeah, The OA is technically a television show, but it might really be an anthology series. Um, it's hard to say. She focuses first mm. on storytelling, second on science fiction which I think is a very nifty and uh, attractive way to watch a story. Yeah. Yeah, I'm less familiar with her. I was thinking, did you ever see uh, The One I Love, the Duplass movie? Uh, Yes. uh, That's the one with Elizabeth Moss? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right, where they meet, like, their doubles as they go away on a three-day weekend or something like that. I watched it a long time ago. Ah, yeah. If we were talking about Blue Jay, I could, like, quote you. Ooh, yeah. Scene by scene, Sarah Paulson's greatness. Yeah. Low-budget sci-fi kind of their own their own beast yeah good picks well that is the very brief first episode of 2019 from us uh that's right let's uh throw them a cheers say goodbye and get recording this next episode let's do it see ya soon run go get to the chopper we have to go
Mexico. I'm coming with you. That was brilliant.